This is Pastor Gabriel Swagger, and welcome once again to another episode of our Crossfire Youth Services. As you can see, the services that we are going to be bringing you is a little bit different than what you would call a normal youth service. And the reason why it's different is simply because we preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We teach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We sing Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So I want you to sit back, enjoy yourself, and I believe that the message we're going to bring you today is anointed by the Holy Spirit. It will be a blessing to your heart and life. So sit back and enjoy the program. Oh, it's precious. 
precious blood, oh Jesus, precious blood. you have your Bibles tonight, turn with me once again to the epistle to the Romans, Paul's epistle to the Romans, the sixth chapter of the epistle of Romans, reading verses seven and eight, Romans chapter six, verses seven and eight, I was talking to our grandfather right before I came over here. And uh, we were just discussing, you know, some of the different things that are going on. He's studying, or they're doing a study on a particular subject over there. And I was telling him about the study that we're doing here. And he says, my Lord, he said, that's a powerhouse of a subject. And I said, it sure is. And he said, he made the statement to me, and it really sunk in when I was driving, you know, the hundred yards or so from the church to here. He says, there are very little churches and youth ministries, very few, that are teaching the message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But there are some, and God's raising up some, like He is with Steve and his family and raising up those in North Florida and those around the country and around the world. They may be a small in stature right now, but do not despise the day of small things because God can take the small to confound the wise. And I believe that's what he's going to do all around the world. And I mean, the subject that we're dealing with in regards to the sanctification process of the believer, this is not something that should, that really, uh, how do I put this the right way? This is not something that is understood by most young people. And we have the privilege tonight to hear it over and over and over. And although what I'm going to say will be somewhat repetitive, I got an email the other day saying that you say the same things over and over and over. I'm like, yeah, two reasons. Number one, there are always new people coming in. And number two, there's always some that haven't gotten it from here to here yet. And it needs to drop from here to here. And when it does, they're finally going to say, I got it. After all those years, I got it. That's the way it happened to me. It took me years, several years, about three years. But when I finally got it, my Lord, I got it. And I think it's going to happen with some of y'all. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 7. Paul would write and say, for he who was dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And I want to use for a subject, really taken from that eighth verse, but we're going to look at both verses tonight. To die with Christ is to live with Christ. To die with Christ is to live with Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ. We are so grateful 
Thankful for your presence that is in this place tonight. Anoint us, for we cannot do without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Anoint our ears to hear what you would have us to say. We ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, asking that you would ever increase as we would ever decrease. And we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Before we get into our subject matter tonight, I want to just say this. In, in, pre in preparing this this morning and going over it this afternoon, asking the Lord for direction as to how he would want me to begin this message, I really felt prompted in my spirit just to go ahead and say this. The foundational doctrine of all doctrines is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, I'm going to say that again because it's so true. The foundational doctrine, in other words, the doctrine of all doctrines, the doctrine in which all other doctrines must be built upon is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And if your foundation is wrong, then your doctrine will be wrong. If your foundation is wrong, your ministry will be wrong. If your foundation is wrong, then whatever you proclaim will be wrong. Just the other day, I got to be honest with myself and honest with you. There are certain television shows on right now that I don't watch because it doesn't interest me. But there are some that when I watch it, I get a little emotional. It's one of those feel-good stories. That you see something and you just watch it and by the time the hour program is up, you're like, <laughs> you know, you know, you can feel it. My wife makes fun of me because of this. I remember, I'll never forget it. This was about a year ago. I was on the, tele, I was on the couch and I was watching TV one night and it was on this program that I'm about to relay to you. And I'm watching it. And I'm sitting there just trying to hold back tears because it was such a, a, an awesome thing and and my wife comes in and she just looks at me. She looks at the TV. She says, oh, God, not again, and walks away. <laughs> but the show that I'm talking about is this show called Extreme Home Makeover. Now you know. Now you know. I got all of you now. Got something on all of you. Because you've all seen it and you've all been the same way. <laughs> you know. But I remember watching it. And what got my attention, I don't remember the circumstances in regards to the family in question, but they bought a home, their first home, after being married. It was what you would call a fixer-upper, and it was a definite fixer-upper. They had planned to spend some money to build this home up in the, in, into their dream home, if you will. They had children, but these children had severe medical problems. I mean, one right after another. One of the parents was laid off from their job. The other one was, their, their earnings were very meager at best. The two kids whom they loved more than life itself, when they developed these medical problems, of course, all of their bills, what little they had, went to help with the medical expenses. This home that they had purchased basically sat untouched. And if you would just look at this home, you would look at it and see if just a slight wind would have come, it would have just destroyed the whole home. You know how it is. They ride, they ride up in that big RV in early, 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 wee, you know, early hours of the morning, get that megaphone and call that last name, the so-and-so family, come on out or whatever it is. And, the family comes out excited, and they started showing the inside of the home. And what caught my attention was right on the side, on the wall of the home, there was a crack. It was going all the way through the foundation, and it went right up the side of the wall, and it was heading up right toward the ceiling. And they said, we wanted to get this fixed, but we really do not know what to do. Come to find out. The foundation that was built for that home some years prior was faulty foundation. They didn't know it, but they were just days away from a home collapsing upon them. Now you think about this. 
A home that was built on this foundation, the foundation was wrong. Cracks in the wall. Things are breaking down. And little did they know that if just, and the guy told him, he said, you, you just got to understand something. Just a little while longer, this whole thing could have come down on all of y'all and destroyed and killed all of y'all. And it got me thinking. That is where most modern churches are. There is a wrong foundation and there's cracks up and down the hall and down the wall. And yet little do they know in just a few days time, the whole thing can come crumbling down on top of them. You got to understand something, young people. Wrong doctrine leads people to hell. Now hold on, I'm going to say it again because it needs to be said. It doesn't matter how popular the person is. It doesn't matter how big the ministry is. It does not matter how much money is flowing through that place. If the foundation is wrong, if the doctrine is wrong, there is no other alternative. They're leading souls to hell. And when the foundation is wrong, nothing can be built on top of it that will stand the test of time. Because when the rains come, and they will come, when Satan comes against them with everything that he can muster, that foundation cannot and will not stand. But when your foundation is right, oh, come on now. I said when your foundation is right, when the foundation is built on the shed blood of the Lamb, when the rains come, when the, when, the, when the storms begin to fall upon you, you may miss some things, you may have some windows blown out, but the foundation will stand, which means that you will stand. That foundation, I'm built on that foundation. What I preach is built on that foundation. You can't get any stronger than Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You can't get any stronger than Christ. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. I'm standing. I said I'm standing. I said I'm standing. When Satan comes, and he will, he'll knock you down. But I can get back up because my foundation is built on Jesus. Glory to God. My Lord, when your foundation is wrong, everything you have will be wrong. But when your foundation is right, that's why Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Because you can build on anything else, and it'll falter. But when you build it on Christ and Him crucified. Mm, come on, you need to get this. When you build your life on Christ and what He did at Calvary. You build your foundation. You, everything you have is built on Christ. And when that happens, when Satan comes against you, when he knocks you down, when he messes you up, when he tries to destroy you, you will still be able to stand. Yes. Now, let, let me give you an example here for a moment. Taken from my sport days, which I don't play anymore. Too old. Knees are messed up. My coach used to always tell me, when you're standing and playing defense, you don't play defense standing straight up. Why? Come here. I'm standing up. Don't, you're right in front of the camera. You block it. Plaid shirt day. <laughs> when, you, when, you, when you're standing flat-footed, push me. See how easy I can fall over? He didn't do much. He just... But when you get down in a defensive stance, get it now? When you're down and you're spread, you're able, you're able to move really quick. And no matter what happens, you're not going to get knocked down too easily. When you're built 
and rooted. This ain't rooted. But when you're rooted in Jesus Christ and what he did at Calvary, Satan is going to come and try to mess you over. But you can still stand knowing that my feet are placed on the solid rock. Now that was just, you have to understand, where is your foundation at? Where is your foundation? What is your foundation? Now Paul would say this, as I dealt with it last week, and I didn't deal with it right at all. I felt, I I was up all night thinking to myself, I didn't do it justice. And it happens. But Paul would tell the church at Rome, in verse 7, for he who is dead is freed from sin. So you have two things here that you want to look at. In this one verse, nine words is all this verse has. Some of you are going to count it. One, two, three, four, five. It's there. Nine words. And yet these nine words speak of such truth. That we have to understand what Paul is saying. First of all, he says this. For he who is dead. Now I want to repeat what I said last week. That Greek word is dead refers to a past action. It happened. When you died or when Christ died, you died with him. That past action was a once for all action. And the Holy Spirit used the best word to describe what is happening. Dead. You got to understand, when you are dead, whatever you're dead to can't control you anymore. You were once a slave to sin, bound by the passions of sin. But when you died in Christ, those passions that once controlled you, that nature that once, boy, I feel this, that once controlled you, the nature, the alcohol that you could not live without, The nicotine that you smoked when you got up and smoked when you went down. The perversion, the immorality that controlled you when you died in Christ. I said when you died in Christ, those things have no more control over you anymore. Because you are dead. And when you're dead, you are dead. But not, but dead to what? The sin nature, it controlled you. But when you now you are in Christ, the Holy Spirit places you into Christ. And because of that, you're dead. But at the, on the flip side, we always like to say, you know, see on the flip side. On the flip side, not only are you dead, but you're freed. Oh, my Lord, my Lord. Have you ever noticed... If you're watching television and somebody had just passed away and you hear the reporters and people talking about them, they always say that their soul is now free. They're dead, but their soul is now free. When you die and you're dead, you have a death experience. You're gone. Your old man has been crucified. Your old man has been buried. Because of that death and burial, sin cannot control you any longer. You have been freed from the power and the dominion of the sin nature. But now when Paul talks about freed, we look at that word freed, and in the Greek it means to justify. But Paul's not speaking of justification. He's talking about sanctification, which means this. Jesus said it, John 8, 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall, no, people say set you free. Uh Uh-uh, that's not what the word says. The word says make you free, because at Calvary, you were set free, but at Calvary, you're made free. Now, let let me change that. At Calvary, you're set free. At Calvary, through the person of the Holy Spirit, as long as you look to Jesus Christ and Him crucified, the Holy Spirit will continually, daily, make you free. 
This is an everyday occurrence. In other words, the Holy Spirit is telling us that not only are you set free, but He's admonishing us to maintain our freedom from moment by moment. Because you know when we walk on this Christian walk, don't expect it to be peaches and cream. Don't expect it to be a bed full of roses. Don't expect it to just tiptoe through the tulips. But the moment you say yes to Jesus Christ, expect the very powers of darkness to come against you, to take you back because you once belonged to Satan. And he doesn't like the fact that he lost you. And he will do everything in his power from the moment you got saved to the moment you die or whatever the case may be to try to get you back into his fold. And he will use any means necessary. Paul really admonishes us through the person of the Holy Spirit to maintain what you got. In other words, the way you got in is how you stay in. How you got in, you stay in. You don't have to come in through this way and then venture off onto something else to try to maintain what you got. Jesus Christ did it all. It goes back to that foundation. If that foundation is right, no matter what comes, you'll stand. But the moment you begin to venture off, as we all do, the moment that we leave the foundational doctrine of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and we begin to venture off into something else, and it doesn't matter what, but more than likely all the time, I shouldn't say more than all the time, it points back to self. When you leave that foundation and try to establish a foundation of your own, you will fail and fail miserably. That's when the old man can resurrect himself and cause us untold problems. So you've got to understand, Paul says you're dead and now you're freed. But that freedom came at a price. Do you get this? Your freedom came with a price. The price of God's only son. Which leads me to the next point. Paul would say, verse number 8, and I'm trying to hurry through this. Now, if we be dead with Christ, since we are dead, with Christ. It's amazing. In the entirety of the sixth chapter of Romans, it deals with death. But the only way to have life is you first to have to die. And you know, it's something else. The death of Christ brings life. You get that? The death of Christ brings life. And what a life it brings! What a glorious life it brings! I mean, words cannot be put, uh, you, can't, you can't talk about it enough, you can't enunciate it enough, you can't pronounce it enough, you don't have the words to talk about it because there are no words to justify the fact how wonderful that this life can be because of what Christ has done for me. But you got to understand, first of all, that everything that he did, he didn't do it for himself. He didn't do it for Satan. He didn't do it for angels. He didn't do it for the animal kingdom. But he did it for me. That means everything that he did, he did it for you and for me. He didn't, he, he didn't deserve what happened to him. We deserved it because we were the ones that crossed God. We were the ones that failed God. And because of the fall... That relationship with God that man had, had been severed. Man, because of the fall and because of sin, is totally depraved. There is no such thing as a moral evolution. There is no such thing as just come to church a little bit and then you'll be okay. As long as you're here, you're all right. It doesn't work that way. Everything that Christ did was for us. Which means that if anyone... It doesn't matter who they are. Even if an angel came down from heaven and began to preach another gospel that is not the gospel of this book, the fact of the matter is it will lead people astray and lead people to hell. 
everything he did was for us. The cross is man's only remedy. I'm going I'm to bear down on this. There is not five different ways to make it right with God. There's not ten different ways to make it right with God. There is only one answer for man's problems. There is only one answer for man's solution, for man's problems and situation. It is the cross. That means it's the cross for the sinner and the cross for the saint. And when anybody tries to preach something else, it is a slap in the face to God himself. Because what they're saying is what God did, what God provided was not enough. The cross is God's walking plank from death unto life. Did you get that? The only way that we could walk into the very presence of God was not by the means of our own self-effort. But the cross of Christ is that walking plank that when we walk it, we transfer from death unto life. You see, there's that chasm right there between God and man. But God knowing this, did not leave man in that condition. He did something about it. He went to, he became man himself, stepped out of eternity and into time to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And the cross of Christ is the only thing that stands between man and hell. Me, make it personal, it's the only thing that stands between me and hell. Me and hellfire, the only thing that stands right there as a sign to those that are just wanting help, it's the cross of Christ. That's the only thing that could could remedy the situation of sin. You see, sin is a disease. Sin equals death. But there is a cure for that disease. It's the cross. But when that foundation is removed, all man has to offer is something of his own making. That's why we say, and rightfully so, that anything other than the cross of Christ is not worth it. That's why the purpose-driven life is such, a, it's such heresy. Because it tells man, you can do it. It tells man, you're able to do it. As long as you do this, you can do it. And the cross says, no, you can't. The cross says, only God can do it. Only Jesus has done it. Outside of that, there is no way for man to get to God. There had to be a death. And when he died, the word had to come to us. It had to be presented to us under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will begin to deal with our hearts to show us who we really are, which is a sinner without God. And at that moment, convict us of what we are and who we are. And to give us the faith to believe Him. And that moment, we died with Christ. Oh, you didn't get this. At that moment, we died with Christ. His death is my death. I associate with that. It's, he's, I know that not only is he my substitute, but I identify with that work on Calvary's cross, knowing it should have been me, but he took my place. And I identify with that for my salvation and for my victory. I identify with his work. But then he says this. We believe that we shall also live with him. His death equals my life. And you got to understand, he's not referring to living with him in heaven. That will happen. If you stay in this course, that will happen. What Paul is referring to here. Is here presently that you can live with him. In other words, that you can live. His victory is now your victory. 
You are placed into Christ. You identify with Christ, which means the Holy Spirit makes available to you everything that Christ did on Calvary's cross. He makes it available to you. In other words, Jesus Christ is the source. The cross is the very means by which we can receive these blessings. But you can't do it without faith. Without faith, it's what? Impossible to please God. God works on the basis of faith. Abraham believed God. It all comes, you know, there was a guy, that, I hate to say, I hate to bring this up, but I'm going to say it. There was a popular Christian artist, and I, I, let, let, me, let me change that. Popular Christian artist, he's not Christian. He's a heretic. That basically said that everything that's in the pages of those Bibles, don't take it literally. Just don't take it literally. And he tried to use Noah and say that how in the world could God bring all those animals on board one ship, one boat, and have them stay there for a determined period of time? They would not fight with each other. He says, I don't believe that. I don't believe that happened. Sir, get saved and you'll believe it. Because all it is is just by faith. If it's in that book, I believe it. Because if God can create the heavens and the earth in six days, if he can create mankind, I think he can handle a small problem of a boat and lots of animals on that boat. Glory to God. He can handle it. I do it by faith. I believe it by faith. It's in the book, so I believe it. Faith. It's faith. You can't be saved without faith. You can't receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit without faith. You can't be victorious without faith. Everything is based on faith. I wasn't there 2,000 years ago. But I believe that when he died, I died with him. And when he was buried, I was buried. And when he rose, I rose with him. My Lord, I believe it. I believe if it says in his word, by his stripes, we are healed. I believe that he can still heal the sick today. I believe that. I believe that he can do that. I believe he can do all things. I believe he can do anything that he wants to. I believe that he can work in my life any way he chooses. I believe he can work in this place any way he chooses. I believe he can take something small and from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and use it to touch the whole entire world for the cause of Jesus Christ. I believe it. Faith is the key that unlocks the door. Without faith, the Holy Spirit bars access. Without faith, the Holy Spirit says you can't come in. But the moment that you believe, that key is inserted. That door is open, and you can walk right on in. I know I used this illustration a while ago, but that door right there, you can't get in. You can look in, but you can't get in. You can walk out, but you can't look in. And when you go to that door right there, Skylar, go to that door and go outside. You, Skylar, look at him, big old buff arms. He's like, I'll work to catch him. Just close the door. Access is barred. He can look in. You see him? He can look in, but when he tries to use any other key, that's not Jesus Christ and him crucified, the Holy Spirit says, "Uh uh-uh, ain't going to happen. But the moment he says, I believe, oh, come on now, I believe, I said, I believe, the Holy Spirit opens the door, and when he walks on in, look at what you're walking into. 
Look at what you're walking into. Look at what you're walking into. Look at what you're walking into. Look at what you're walking into. My Lord, my Lord. You're walking in to more abundant life right here because Jesus Christ provided it at Calvary's cross. Glory to God. He opens the door and I can walk right on in into the very power of Almighty God. Woo! Glory. You can't do that with anything else. But when Jesus Christ did it, the Holy Spirit opened that door and I could walk right on in. And the Holy Spirit oversees everything. He oversees it all. My, he disperses it out. He gives us everything that, my, do you get this? He gives us everything that Jesus Christ paid for. He doesn't just do something and just say, you don't deserve the rest. He gives it. He gives it. He gives it. Everything that Jesus Christ paid for. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't demand much, but he does demand that your faith, my faith, be anchored in Christ and him crucified. You see, if it's not, you go back to your old life. And I don't want to go back to my old life. Some of you, I know, you don't want to go back to your old way of doing things. That's why we need him more now than what we did yesterday. That's why you're going to need him more tomorrow than what you did today. That's why you're going to need him more next week than what you did this week. I need him more because I don't want to go back there. God only works and he only goes forward. There's never a retreat button with God. Let that sink in. We retreat. God never retreats. His command is always forward. No matter how, how, well, what the situation is, go forward. Why? Because I believe God can make a way where there seems to be no way. God can open up a Red Sea. He can open up whatever he chooses to. Singers, musicians, make your way back. He demands faith, that our faith ever be anchored in Christ and what he did at Calvary. And the moment we do that, that's when victory is mine. Jesus Christ paid for it so I could have it, not to withhold it from me. You ever been, well, if you have brothers or sisters or if you have kids, if you ever had seen or have done this, and held something out for your baby brother or sister, and they go to reach for it, and you take it away from them? God don't do that. He gives it to us. But it's by faith. And guess what? We don't earn it. We don't have to earn it. He just says, here, I paid for it. And the Holy Spirit oversees it all. But I don't want to go back to the way I used to be. You've got to understand that you've died with Christ. And if you're in Christ, you can live with him. This is the key of more abundant life, what I'm teaching. If you grab a hold of it, I'm not saying you'll never have a problem. But I am saying that sin will not have dominion over you. I am saying that you can stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. Stand to your feet. As they sing this song... As we close tonight, I want us to gather around this front. Everybody, if you can, and if you, if you have to leave, we understand. But I want you to come around this front as close as you can. And as they sing this song, I want this song to be made your prayer. To say, Lord, I need you more. More than yesterday. I don't want to go back to the old way, my old life. Slip up your hands across this building. Sing it now. Just make this your prayer, Lord. I need you more. More than words can say. More than ever before. Sing it one more time. 
need you more. Thank you, Jesus. next heartbeat. And softly when every head bowed and every eye closed. I feel right now in my spirit, I believe everyone in here is saved. But this appeal is for watching, for those watching and listening right now. Some of you are watching and listening and saying, you know what? I'm living a life of sin. I'm miserable. It's controlling me. No matter what I do, and I can't seem to stop it. I'm here to give you hope. And it's not found in a bottle or a pill, but it's found in a man, Jesus Christ. And I'm going to do this right now. I feel led in my spirit to do it. It's to say the sinner's prayer for you. You may be watching and say, I've never once accepted Jesus Christ. Now is your time. The Bible says today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. Don't put it off. You may be right now, wherever you may be, bound by drugs and alcohol but Jesus Christ can set you free he can set you free right now if you let him first things first I want to tell you that God loves you everything he did was for you he sent his only begotten son to die upon a cruel cross for you to save you to free you in a moment we're going to say what is known as the sinner's prayer and I want you to say this with us. Saying words won't do anything, but you have to believe these words. It's faith that unlocks the door of salvation. You've got to believe it. And I want you to say it with me. These that are here, the singers, are going to repeat it after me. They're going to say it with you to help give you strength. And I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to say it with me right now. Dear God in heaven. I come to you in the name of Jesus. I'm sorry for my sins, the way I've lived, the things that I've done. Forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. With my mouth, I confess the Lord Jesus and in my heart I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and he is alive and right now at this moment I believe that I'm washed that I'm cleansed that I'm forgiven that I am saved let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise at that moment, when you said yes to Jesus, angels in heaven begin to shout the praises of God because a new name is written down in glory and it belongs to you. Jesus Christ turned to the Father and said, Father, another one has just come home. Another one has just come home. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. As we sing it one more time, I want you all over this building, let's raise our hands one more time. And I want you to make this your prayer. 
more than my next heartbeat. Lord, more than anything. More than anything. As time goes by, I'll be by your side. I'll be by your side. Cause I never want to go back. Sing it one more time. No, I never want to go back. Never want to go back to my old life. Say it now. I hope and pray that you've enjoyed today's program, and I really believe it was a blessing to your heart and life. But before we close off and before we sign off for tonight's program, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell others about the Crossfire program. I want you to tell your young people, your young adults in your church to tune in every week to our Crossfire Youth Ministry services. And I know as what we are preaching, what we are giving to the people, it will be a blessing. Thank you so much for being with us today. This is Gabriel Swaggart saying we'll see you next time in the Lord.